Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fifth and final CERC talk of 2020. It's been quite a year <laughs> thus far, and this is actually our closer to our mission engineering series. Thank you again for uh, giving us your time today and joining us. Um, for those joining it for the first time, uh, my name is Mimi Marcus. I'm the CERC Talks webinar coordinator. I hope everyone's uh, staying safe. Um, and just given some of the divergence of uh, all the different virtual platforms that folks have been using, uh, some pointers to joining uh, in this talk. Um, you'll note we have a chat module as well as a Q&A module. Um, please keep your comments in the chat feature uh, and utilize the Q&A for any questions you may have for our presenter today. Um, if you have uh, the same question as any that have been entered in, you'll note that you'll be able to upvote your question. Um, and following the talk, we'll be addressing those questions if they haven't already been addressed in the presentation. Uh, and I'll be uh, asking you if you'd like to ask your question directly and you can unmute yourself to do so at the uh, final five to 10 minutes. Um, now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Barry Beam, not only the chair of our CERC Research Council, and current principal investigator of CERC Research Task WRT 1016, reducing total ownership costs and schedule, as well as um, prior uh, principal investigator of the LT's Trade Space and Affordability Project, which was a multi-year, multi-million dollar research task, courting many of our CERC collaborating institutions, um, but also the CERC Talks Editor-in-Chief. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Barry Bain will be introducing our esteemed speaker and leading our discussion at the end of today's presentation. With that, Barry, turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so again, the, the Defense Department uh, uh, gets involved in a number of different kinds of, of missions uh, where the, the, there are various parts of the Defense Department. Uh, excuse me, let me get my other phone off. Um, uh, it, it, they involve various organizations, uh, various uh, uh, specialty activities, uh, various kinds of, uh, of people, uh, uh, resources, uh, physical resources, uh, and the like, and uh, uh, all having to do with the uh, integrating not only with organizations, but other non-defense organizations and uh, carrying off missions with, which uh, will have uh, other uh, 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 collaborators or people who are uh, uh, be trying to uh, 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 divert the mission and, and the like. So uh, uh, all of this uh, is a, a tremendously complex integration challenge, and so we're very fortunate to have Elmer Roman, uh, who is uh, the DOD director for uh, 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 mission integration and has a lot of experience in uh, 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 contending with these and then coming up with uh, successful missions. So. Elmer, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Boehm. Uh, it's really a pleasure being here with you today and uh, with the rest of the community. Um, so today, um, I'm going to take the opportunity to, to briefly, you know, chat about, you know, the what we call the practice of mission in integration or, or mission engineering, in a sense. You know, really, and what we're trying to do within the department at the Office of Secretary of Defense level especially on the research and engineering and in conjunction with our partners in the joint staff and, and the uh, acquisition and sustainment side of the house and OSD and to figure out how do we focus and synchronize these efforts uh, so that we can really uh, develop the capabilities that we need to support war fighting missions uh, uh, in the years to come. So that's kind of the, the in a sense, the, the, the intent of this talk is to walk you through uh, where we are, where we head in and uh, what's coming down the pipe with regard to uh, activities on our end. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start with the first set of slides and kind of just give you a, a perspective on how the thing fits together. Uh, in a sense, uh, when you start thinking about engineering at large, and or you look at the Office of Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, you know the organization is broken down uh, after the, it was actually uh, the, the separation of activities that were happening under 
advanced technology and logistics under research and engineering, and then the acquisition of sustainment. So within uh, the, uh, the research and engineering community, you have two, two lanes. You have the research and technology activity. Those are the basic research, applied research activities, and then leading to uh, the technology development of what we know in the RDT and E community as 6.1 to 6.3. And then you have the from the prototyping and engineering activities to system engineering all the way up to you know the, the actual transition to program to record. Um, within the, uh, the, and that would be the activities that we do under advanced capability under Mr. Jim Faced. And under Jim Faced, uh, we have a, a series of organizations uh, that includes uh, prototyping and sustainment, uh, includes, uh, I apologize, it looks like I lost the, okay. Uh, it, 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 prototyping on software, and then there's the engineering, and then of course there's the, uh, the activities related to uh, test and evaluation or TRMC. Uh, within the engineering directorate, uh, we have uh, a series of organizations that includes the uh, strategic intelligence analysis cell, which is mostly responsible for the, the threat analysis to truly really understand that we understand the threat environment, let's say it in the 2030 timeline. And then uh, they conduct their war games and analysis for us to understand uh, what the environment looks like from a red perspective. Then we the mission integration, you know, we, uh, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more as I go through the slides. Then you have the, uh, the mission engineering activities and, and the concept maturation activities that really lead, lead us to one is to truly really understand the mission space. Uh, like that, Dr. Bowen mentioned is a very complex mission space with uh, multiple, a multitude of missions and, and uh, activities that need to be synchronized. But then at the same time, identify the different capability and options that we have to go and do this mission. So that's what part of the mission engineering uh, effort is. And, but it is in a sense done in a, sense, uh, in, a, in a way that we're thinking of it as things that happen left of systems engineering. You know, it's a conceptualization uh, thinking that needs to happen so that we can truly understand the operational context in which those new capabilities and new technology will operate so that then the system engineering can do their proper uh, requirements validation or analysis and functional decomposition and development of those product architectures. Then we have, uh, as we do the handoff from the mission integration on the mission engineering side of the house with what we have in terms of government reference architectures, then, then we provide that there, there's some touch points with the uh, prototyping activities or the prototyping groups where then they, they take uh, the, those reference architectures and then they do the, the necessary analysis for them to further develop those product architectures. Same thing goes with those programs or records that are already ongoing and they just need to do perhaps a, a, a technology refresh of some modernization or the startup of a new program. And then finally is the developmental tells and evaluation assessment groups that tell us how things are going with regard to those ongoing programs. That's where our independent technology uh, uh, reviews uh, take place uh, where we determine whether you know, the performance of that system is along um, par with the, the threat environment, let's say in the 2030 timeframe. And then we have our course, our engineering policy and systems group that provides the guidance. And uh, that's all the, the folks that work on the, and that's Stephanie Purcell, who's actually our acting engineering lead now uh, after the retirement of Dr. Sandy Magnus. And then she's the one that provides the policy, you know, that DLD instruction 5,000.88 on engineering just came out. And then the, of course, the mission engineering guide that was released yesterday. If you Google mission engineering guide, you'll be able to find it in our website in the, uh, the r and &E, uh, acquisition uh, advanced capabilities website. So this is in a sense, the engine that kind of drive things and the interactions and touch points with the differing organizations. Uh, the, uh, the, cri the critical component of this is to make sure that uh, we, we are integrated uh, in the, let's see, going to the next slide. Let's see, oh, yeah. The next slide then the reason kind of, kind of highlights is the fact that we do this because the, uh, the Congress realized back in 2017 is that we had to do better at integrating all these concepts, you know, all these activities and all these technologies. And, uh, and as the, the, the department develops requirements for new programs, we got to put this in some sort of operational context. So they gave us the task to go ahead and look at it from a, from a perspective of, hey, how do we can develop the infrastructure that is needed, both from the engineering uh, and, and the analysis and the, the actual tools that we need so that the Department of Defense can start doing more in-house analysis, you know, in this case, real more analysis that, that has engineering rigor to it, to truly understand the, 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 the mission context on which we, we expect to be operating in, a, in, in the future. 
And that as well also asks for, hey, also look in terms of how do we implement this uh, section 2446 Charlie, which is the most uh, the modular open system uh, approaches or architectures that we keep talking about a lot, but still we have seen to be having problems with. So we you know that's a requirement for us to look into how do we go and implement MOSA across the department. And then of course, you know, how do we develop the vision, mission based inputs to be able to drive the development of new war fighting concepts or new operational plans or capabilities uh, or based on capabilities that we will have, not in today, but in the you know 10 years down the road. Uh, all of this coming together as well as we develop the technology investment roadmaps and so on. And we work with uh, acquisition and sustainment teams to, to look, at, uh, look at it from a programmatic or capability portfolio management so that we know exactly, you know, are we going to meet the demand? And then the question is, are we building the right things going forward? So the, the way that, that we implement the, we're implementing this with a mission integration, again, my office, is to look at it from uh, an engine that uh, mostly, you know, with its heart being in, on the, with the mission engineering, where we do their mission analysis and we do the mission decomposition and characterization, develop the metrics, and then uh, do the hard, hardcore analysis to develop those architectures to really drive the development of these new concepts, your development of these new ideas that eventually will get fed in, back into uh, uh, the joint war firing concepts, or if not, then the operational plans being developed by, by the combatant commands. And at the same time, on their capabilities and capability integration, you know, we're looking at those activities that then allow us to really do better integration and interaction with the programs of record. So that, for example, as we develop the next generation uh, NC3, Nuclear Command and Control Communications Architecture, we're leveraging from lessons learned that of studies we have had done under, for example, JASC2, the Joint All Domain Command and Control, and then feed that into. Uh, into the, the NC3 next gen architecture efforts. So again, it has to be an integrated effort uh, and it cannot be divorced from what's happening on the a &S side of the house or what's happening in the joint staff or what's happening at the services. So again, mission integration at the end is really synchronizing those concepts, those technologies, those requirements and programs that will eventually guide those key enterprise decisions. So, and then working with our modernization principal director is say, okay, how do we define our, our future with regard to direct energy, for example, or hypersonics, or cyber, or autonomy, or in, in, case, in this case, uh, uh, artificial intelligence? Um, and, uh, and then the same thing with other areas that we're currently working on. Uh, I have, uh, so, so uh, uh, direct uh, tasking that, in, in a sense, is that I got to work, be working on. And since I got back in the department in August, uh, one of the key things is really disseminating this mission engineering uh, construct and uh, framework. Uh, now it's being codified in our mission engineering guide that we made it, uh, it was released by the department yesterday. And again, you have, you'll be able to have access to it in a, on, online by just Googling uh, mission engineering guide, which provides the process and methodology to follow so that we can start converging in some sort of a coherent dialogue as we relate to mission engineering. Uh, today, we, we find that, you know, mission engineering has been done uh, by industry, uh, it's been done by uh, many of the community and practitioners of the labs, uh, but it's referred some place as digital engineering, others as uh, model-based system engineering, all the places that have been just on the fence. Uh, but at the end, it's uh, they all, they all, a lot of these activities are complementing each other, but we just wanna make sure there's a common framework to it. Um, the, the, also, the, the other thing that we, 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 again, it's really critical is the management of those government reference architectures, whether it's on the mission front or on the capability front, uh, but to ensure that at, at, least at, the, at the end, the department is actually well informed in terms of how the individual uh, program architecture or capability architectures that have been developed by the services or the agencies fit at the end from a joint war fighting perspective. And then, of course, uh, engaging and providing that training material that is needed for that community to really follow a common framework for, for the uh, mission engineering process. Uh, and then uh, the, the one thing that I'm currently also working on, again, working multiple things as FY21, uh, this fiscal year is our initial operational capability for mission engineering, is really to instantiate that environment and that infrastructure that allows to do the proper knowledge management, meaning collecting all this data and then be able to distribute and share the data and, and then finally even make sure we do an efe efficient and effective use of that knowledge. So that's all part of the, the, the portfolio that we're working on. Um, that's in addition to also building the teams that, that are gonna be working on the studies uh, so to identify the, those future investments that we need uh, to make. 
Uh, at the end is, uh, you know, what I'm trying to get to is really to inform uh, leadership in terms of are we building the right things, but you're just not building things right. Again, system engineer, I'm a system engineer myself. You know, we, we're very concerned about make sure that, hey, I'm giving a task and go and build this widget and I want to make sure that widget's built right. But am I building the right widget? You know, that, and that's the key question. Oh, and I'm sure it's the right widget, but is it built in the right widget within the right context, within the right timeline and space? And that's what we make sure that uh, we, we answer those questions. Uh, and then and that will help us identify as well the, what are the still those critical gaps that, that will allow us to really close as we do our analysis. Uh, I'm also uh, responsible for supporting the development of those joint warfighting concepts. Again, as I, as I explained, through our concept maturation team. And then, uh, and then make sure those architecture we develop truly form the development of those, uh, those concepts themselves. Uh, if you think in terms of the JWC that is currently being led by the, being developed by the joint staff, uh, there are four lines of action or four, four supporting concepts, uh, which one relates to joint fires. Uh, the other one is on information advantage, uh, joint C2, command and control. And then last one be joint contested logistics. You know, we're operating a, a, you know, obviously move our logistics in a, in a contested environment. All of that, again, it's has to be put in a, into a, a reference so that people understand uh, okay, if I'm going to develop the capability of technology here, how does that fit within the bigger picture? Uh, and then, of course, uh, from the capability integration perspective, as I mentioned, uh, supporting JASC2 and development of those technical architectures as they relate to modern net modernization areas for future network command and control and communications. Uh, it's a lot of the work that, uh, you know, informing MDA and, and helping in the process of developing new capability for homeland defense or missile defense. And then, of course, the NC3, as I mentioned. Again, informing requirements, programs, investment decisions, uh, that's what we aim to in, uh, influence in this process. Mentioned the mission engineering guide. Uh, again, we didn't want it to uh, develop a mission engineering gu guide that was prescriptive, you know, like do this first and then next and next. What we really want to make sure is speak to that novice or is not that practitioner in terms of, hey, let's organize our thought process. Let's follow this construct in terms of, okay, just start with a well uh, uh, understood and well-refined question. Do we know what we're asking? And that, that's the, that usually you have to make sure you go back to the leadership and ensure and say, hey, you, you told me I need to do this. Am I addressing it from the right perspective? And yesterday I was actually interested, interesting when I you know, briefed the, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Hyden, and, and uh, we, we presented four problems or four studies that we're going to be starting uh, this quarter. And he, uh, he rightly so say, okay, you got the right question, but you're missing this, right? That missing this or just add, or add this to that, that's really critical because that's really what drives really in a, in a sense, uh, are we truly addressing the key questions that the department needs to be asking itself before we proceed in making investments. Um, I would say 90% or 80%, I'll, let me be more optimistic. A lot of the investment the department makes are based on uh, ideas that are coming from the bottom up uh, and then leadership concern from the top down, but at the end, they don't meet in that happy medium where say, do I truly understand the problem space? Do I really, have I captured the question that I need to answer, identify what my hypothesis is, uh, and then what's the scenarios or what are the, the, the problems that I'm trying to operate in, and then, and then be able to identify what my outputs are deliverable, what I really want to get out of this. So, so that's what we're driving with this mission engineering guide, uh, really put some discipline in the process of doing engineering analysis, uh, more of a quantitative perspective as well versus just qualitative uh, 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 thought processes. And then ensuring that uh, at the end, we, we have a set of common terms and definitions that we can communicate and, uh, and, and relate to. So this guide, again, is out there. Um, it's, it's for everybody to consume. And, and of course, it's gonna be a living document that eventually we would like to go back and revisit six months from now and, and ensure that Hey, uh, we could capture enough of the uh, community of interest or community concerns or, or, or idea how we can improve uh, the, 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 the current mission engineering framework that we're establishing in the department. We do have uh, a series of, of uh, what we call engineering, mission engineering uh, consumers of these products. Uh, you think in terms of, uh, as we try to link uh, this relevant context or your bridge between the technologies and the operational planners you know, that bridging that needs to happen in there, uh, obviously you have to go start from that, again, in, in forming those concepts and be able to mature some of these ideas to as well develop uh, uh, and provide input to 
uh, those technology roadmaps so that uh, we can uh, you know, be able to make sure that we invest in the right set of tools, uh, working with our prototyping experimentation teams and, and folks, you know, make sure that they're well informed about what our findings are with regard to the, the mission space. And then of course, the challenges that we see in order to meet those mission objectives. Uh, this, this also part of it, it's also informing acquisition, uh, the, the whole requirement generation process, working with the joint staff, the services and ANS on that end. And then of course, uh, uh, as the, uh, as the uh, community also engage in the assessment of ongoing programs, uh, make sure that, that we inform decision makers in terms of uh, the well of the uh, performance of the ongoing programs, whether they're on track, where they're on track to meet the, the, the threat in a particular time frame. There's a, where there's a need for a technology refresh, or whether we need to cancel this program because of obsolescence and uh, and the threat has evolved. So I think it's it's really cool that we think in those terms. Um, I did mention already that the mission engineering guide kind of provides that framework on how do we do mission engineering. It's we were to think about it again. We, we're trying to get to some sort of deliver planning approach where where we get our engineers the opportunity to think to think through the problems, analyze and organize the thought process so that. We can integrate all these ideas uh, from a, a mission-based perspective and uh, or, or operational perspective, and so that we can then scale the the, the concepts on on those systems, uh, so that at the end we can achieve those desired warfighting mission effects. So, so the process really start with that early analysis, like I mentioned, uh, with that mission setting, the true understanding of the operational problem, uh, the, in, the intel uh, that that we have, uh, the and then of course you know what are my operational constraints. Uh, with regard to rules of engagement, or what's my, my, my what are the, the constraints that I have with regard to the environment itself that I'm going to be uh, dealing with? Or if not, then the, the war fighting uh, construct, you know, how does that change? Are we, are we going to fight something differently because of uh, the capabilities that we expect to have in a, in a 2030 timeframe, for example, are much different than, than what we have today. Uh, and then it gets to the mission analytics, you know, that piece of, of really truly having a common set of tools and uh, models that, that, that we all agree on, that those are the, the, the right set of tools that we can use for, for a lot of this analysis and be able to share the data, uh, have a common understanding of the metrics, being either the met metrics of measures of efficiency for or efficacy to ensure that we are meeting the objectives of the mission or being the measure of success of, or, or the measure of performance of the different platforms that are gonna be part of the, of the, of the architecture that are gonna be allow us to meet those objectives. And then of course the uh, mission focused threat inform uplets that address the fact that, hey, you know, whatever solution architecture we develop, again, it goes back to think about the mission first, first for the platforms, instead of the other way around where we usually we think about the platform and then find a mission for it. So that's what we're trying to get to. And that's, uh, again, it's uh, identify those capabilities and those system interdependencies uh, so that we can co go in and close those mission gaps. Um, I think at the end really it's, uh, it's truly really important that that we, we truly understand what the problem is, what the questions are, uh, so that that moving forward, uh, you know, the community kind of converge into a real critical think uh, thought process that that uh, we're leveraging each other efforts and uh, and we're truly you know getting the best ideas to play as we try to address the mission challenge in the down 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 range. Uh, and, and truly, is uh, are we really informing uh, the leadership in terms of being able to build the right things uh, versus just building things right. That's that's really a critical part of the process. The uh, I, I think I talk about this. This is a methodology that you're gonna read at the in the mission engineering guide that walks you through from the mission analysis and planning perspective, perspective to the mission analysis execution and the re re reporting and documentation. You can see again, it's what you know highlight the carefully articulated problem statement and the characterization of the mission and the identification of metrics is critical, truly critical to this to settle this process. Now we really need to sit down with those mission planners and then listen to them, see, hear their challenges. But then at the same time, the technologies, the, the operational planners need to think to sit down with the technologies and hear them as well in terms of what's the art of the possible. Now, obviously we got to, Put some boundaries to those uh, out of the possible, so they truly understand what's expected <clears throat> measure of performance that we expect from these capabilities, and then do the dry run, do the analysis. You know, look at the assets baseline architectures, and then run them in the scenario 
And then within that same scenario, what if, if I have new technology, new capabilities, and then so we can run those 2B architecture and prove whether we have make a difference. And, and that includes also uh, ensuring that we have the right models, the same data, uh, and, the, and then at the end, these end products uh, are really are, are, are assess from uh, uh, the same, the same uh, uh, scenario construct uh, that, that we, you know, we crave these days to have, which is not there. Um, again, in, in a same, at the same time as well, is uh, one challenge for the community is there are hundreds of uh, tools out there that are being used by industry, uh, by the FFR disease in the UARCs, as well as, uh, as, well as the labs, the service labs and, and others. Uh, we really need to get to consensus about the different data and, and, and models that we need and, uh, and then start growing those. Uh, it, you know, right now the investors are being made in a stuff by fashion based on whoever, you know, have the interest, but we, we truly need to, you know, converge and, uh, and, and bring unity to these efforts uh, so that we can, we can all have a common, a common approach to uh, of doing this type of analysis. Um, with regard to our mission studies for FY21, uh, these are actually, uh, uh, we got to these topics uh, from interactions we had uh, with the joint staff and and some of the co-coms, the combatant commands, uh, in a sense, to try to truly understand, okay, given the, 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 the short time timeline that I was given, is uh, what would be the 21, 2021 studies that or areas that we need to assess uh, so that at least we can influence, uh, you know, going forward, the development of those joint war fighting concepts or POM 23 decisions. And uh, we, we got together with the joint staff, uh, a couple of the co-coms and some of the OSD uh, stakeholders we identify these areas being, uh, we call it this mission engineering threats. Uh, in the area of uh, the department just came up with a new electromagnetic spectrum uh, operations uh, uh, strategy. So, you know, look at it from, from a perspective of maneuver and uh, mission data integration. And then at the same time, how AI and artificial intelligence, all these new technologies can be leveraged to support this. Uh, high energy lasers, I mean, we have, the department's been working on high energy lasers for, some, for so long. Now we are at the time where they're, they're at that inflection point where the technology can start delivering. Well, the question in what mission context? So in this case, how can we use that for uh, defense against cruise missile or base defense, right? So that's another area where we expect to grow. To really understand the challenges to the, to the kill chain as well as the, the challenges to the survivability of the system and so on. Uh, with the end of the PNT, position navigation is, you know, how do we assure uh, uh, GPS uh, or, 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 or PNT, position navigation and timing in a contested environment. That's critical. We got to get our thoughts on that. And, and that's a, a critical activity we're going to be working on. We hear about hypersonics. So again, looking at it from a campaign perspective, what the trade-off that needs to happen on that end, uh, cyber operations. Uh, and then the one in all domain effects, so I'll have to say that's an interesting one is we do not have tools or ways in the department to, to do an analysis of the combined effects of multiple set of options. Like if you use EW or cyber and, and the compounding effects of that. So, and can you do that at the campaign level? So that's critical and that's part of the studies. Um, with regard to JAS C2 and, and the zero trust architectures, again, look at how do we can employ that type of uh, approaches for be able to protect the data and information in there. And then on the autonomy front, it's uh, okay. We, we have talked about autonomy for many, many years and, and vaccines at the point where it's already there. The question is, okay, how do we make it more efficient and uh, how do we measure uh, the, its uh, level of uh, impact given a, a particular mission? So, so this is, uh, these are the studies that we got going on. Of course, a couple others uh, that will be ongoing uh, at the higher classification levels, but uh, these things will eventually might end up being on a higher classified side, but, uh, but at least for now, uh, this is what I can communicate at this, at this level in terms of uh, the areas of interest, uh, at least at this moment. Uh, I'm sure this is going to evolve. There's going to be if we work with CAPE and others, uh, we're going to be, there's some other areas we're going to be addressing, but uh, these are the early starts for us to, to consider this year. Um, and then again, we talk about architectures and, and, and challenges that we have with emission engineering. Uh, and it's obviously, uh, you know, how do you analyze all of this, right? There's a lot of system of systems uh, activities that, you know, thoughts uh, that we need to give into this. And do we have the right set of tools available? Uh, I find myself that, for example, in development of architectures right now, we rely on Cameo, some others doing on Visio, Visio, others doing whatever they have or, or you know, or, or a napkin. Uh, can I get to modeling tools that, that are more uh, intuitive, that allow us to, to be more, do this in a more dynamic fashion, 
uh, that's you know that's what we want to get to. Uh, same thing about how do we evaluate these complex operational architectures, uh, given the, the the trade space that we we're looking into. I mean that we need to really get in, in consensus on those, those those kind of questions, and then uh, and we really need to ensure that uh, mission engineering becomes a repeatable process that uh, people can and then the reusability of the models so that that we all can you know agree on hey yeah this is a really working construct that allows to sit down and talk at the using the same terminology same language um, and and then of course the knowledge management activities that i think is critical again eventually we're going to have okay, have a, we need to have our hands on uh, you know all the activities going on all the data that might be happening perhaps we don't and all of it resides in one place but we know where to get it where to get it from uh, right now, we just, uh, from a department perspective, we're too fragmented and we need to converge. So uh, that's the only way that we can win future fights if we don't, if we, it's by that unity of effort. And that's what we're hoping to do here. And then uh, we can drive the department to really uh, pursue uh, and adopt this threat informed uh, top down approach from the point of view of do we truly understand what we need? What, what's from a leadership perspective, are we given the proper guidance? Do we, am I actually thought enough about the, my problem and the questions I need to ask? And I think we owe that to the engineering practitioner that's trying to develop systems. So, so this is really more also an effort of putting some discipline into the investment decision process. And finally, again, I, I mentioned the uh, knowledge management uh, uh, architecture we're trying to put in place. Uh, and again, uh, we think it's uh, by providing a good construct on where we can provide transparency and sharing of the data and the models, not only from the government side, but from the industry. Industry have actually come out and say, hey, I got models I want you to use. Uh, so let's figure out how do we make that happen. But of course, you know, make sure that we are protecting the, uh, the intellectual property uh, from the industry side. And then a collaborative environment where we can actually, uh, uh, everybody can come in, play and, uh, you know, share information, uh, run models uh, without making actually this activity be, uh, to uh, honor us to, 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 the, to our budget. I mean, we really need to make sure that we simplify a lot of these engagements and uh, reduce the cost on the analysis so that we can invest more of that money into the actual bending hardware and doing more prototyping and technology development. And then uh, finally, it's the curation of the data. Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, we, we really need to make a better effort of ensuring that we we're talking from the same, same reference, but at the same time, uh, we have uh, trustworthy data that we can actually use uh, for for analysis activities at the OSD level. Again, uh, at the end of the, the a lot of decisions usually happen at uh, at the service level and the you know, but but you know for the most part the leadership uh, in the in the department needs to get a better grasp of okay where do I need what sort of guidance do I give the services in terms of investment and at the same time they need to be able to be able to shift the direction of the department uh, so that we can meet the demands of the challenge of the 21st century. Uh, so again, a, a establishing a collaborative environment uh, a, that we have sharing the, the software tools, uh, understanding whether there are gaps in software that I need to invest to develop those capabilities so I can do an end-to-end -end campaign analysis. Uh, even if the, the tools are not there and they don't communicate, how do I make them communicate? Uh, or do I need to develop new tools? That's actually part of uh, our, our, our challenge going forward. So um, I think that's, uh, that was the last of the slide that I had. Um, I'm, I'm actually open to questions um, from the group, uh, if there are any, over. Thanks so much, Roman. Yes, there is a tremendous amount of discussion happening, <laughs> um, as well as uh, questions that are already in the queue. Um, as I kind of uh, parse through the chat, I'll start off with the Q&A though. Um, Alejandro Hernandez uh, says, I'm familiar with mission engineering, uh, and while it is important to synchronize uh, DOD activities in support of warfighter capabilities, that has always been a goal for providing capabilities. The actual integration issue is successfully integrating a new system into an existing organization of people, systems, processes, trainings, operations, and infrastructure. The failure of this integration is why we have new products sitting unused in, uh, in different units. How does the uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense mission integration address these issues? Yeah, and, that's, and that is a very good question um, because for the most part, it's what, what I mentioned. You know, the department had focused itself at, uh, you know, like uh, one is it's obviously the lab. There's a tremendous amount of uh, good activity going on and coming up with ideas and product development of products. 
But if we don't make those products and develop this product within a, a, some sort of a mission or operational construct, then it's, you know, a lot of the stuff would end up sitting on the shelf. So instead of, you know, you know, this approach of, you know, like just build it and, you know, throw over the fence and let it survive the value of death. I mean, we're trying to get down to be able to identify, hey, here are my critical challenges that I need to address. And, and these are the right sort of things that we need to meet that demand. I mean, how we get there, I mean, I'm not going to, I mean, we, we're not going to tell you whether you just use this particular technology versus these other. I mean, that's up to the creati creativity of the community. But, but I think that's going to help uh, alleviate some of these problems where, you know, for the most part, you have this uh, genius uh, going on in the lab developing a technology that will address that particular problem. But because you have to go through this bureaucracy to get some visibility of this effort, uh, then, then it becomes a problem. But, uh, but at, at the end, if that person, that individual will have the opportunity to say, hey, I'm referring to this mission engineering study that says that here's the capability and how my technology is actually addressing it, then that opens the door for us in mission integration to be able to say, yep, I'm very interested in that. And, and the, 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 about the collaborative environment, the idea here is, is that I need just to ask the question, I mean, I mean, what sort of capabilities are out there address this particular problem? And I should be able to canvas the, the community at large and, uh, and get the answers, and then that's where the integration the interaction will take place. So uh, I, I think it's, uh, it, it will help alleviate some of that. You might not get rid of all of it, uh, because sometimes we have uh, technology ideas that have not even been considered as part of the options that we put in in our mission studies. But that's what we're there for, right? We need to make sure that this is a continuous dialogue. Uh, and we need to have this kind of forums where people say, hey, you know, I know about somebody doing this. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have an, uh, an Alexa or uh, or Cortana, uh, or some sort of <laughs> AI out there that is pulling it all together. But eventually, I want to get there. That to just know who's doing what and what are the promising technologies on the road. Just give us time. We, we're, we're getting there. To <laughs> so, and Alejandro, if uh, you're able to unmute yourself, if you'd like to elaborate more on on your question. No, I, I I'm on mute. I just uh, yeah, the, I understand the uh, how how that was uh, answered. I would I would recommend that uh, just as you would in any business practice where you have a champion for any uh, any new item being brought forward, uh, that that there perhaps ought to be a um, a more structured way to have a champion for whatever technology that you're developing, and that to match that between a need that has been identified within the force and the technology itself. And it needs to begin very early that that conversation and that partnering uh, be structured and be developed right away because that's, that's the main reason uh, why those issues I identified in, in not being integrated into the infrastructure of an organization, its people, its processes, its training rhythm, its entire up, to, up tempo, those are, those are big issues that a commander, the unit, the, the unit that's being commanded, uh, find very troublesome and will and will dissuade them from using a new technology. Uh, so, if I can ask you formalize that uh, that partnership and that champion for that technology, uh, so that conversation begins very early on. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I want, I'll share this. Uh, the, you know, we started also like the interaction with the industry. We're trying to formalize that, that discussion as well because uh, there's a lot of activity that we're not aware of, especially in their investment with their IRAT funds. And uh, what we want to make sure we have this, you know, we're establishing a broad area announcement uh, that allows the contract mechanism for us to have conversation at the higher classification level from the get-go so that they are informed about our, our, our challenge and mission construct concepts and the uh, and, and then we can share those architectures early on so that then they can go and work in the right set of technologies that we need to, to address those problems. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Uh, and, and I know that's uh, something that other folks have brought up in the chat as well. Um, so appreciate you formalizing that. Um, some other questions are coming in and Rob Lewis, you're able to unmute if you'd like to ask your question directly. Great, thank you. Um, excellent talk, by the way. Uh, my question resolves around, it, in, in looking at mission engineering and going through your handbook, uh, it deals very well, I think, with the suitability questions, right? So you have a need statement and you're attempting to find, you know, uh, ways 
to uh, suitably satisfy that need, right? Uh, the question is really about in means, right? So the, the acceptable expenditure of finite resources, um, this can be time or money or risk to the warfighter, right? Um, what in this what in this process, because I'm, I'm still going through it and it's a bit fuzzy, um, basically assesses value of a capability, a mission or an aspect, you know, um, whatever level of resolution you have uh, and enables the objective uh, resource allocation, right? Because, you know, you have a finite amount of time, you have a finite amount of money uh, that you have to distribute and at various levels, right? And you're also, usually talking about complex trades, right? Because uh, the movement, right, uh, in a particular mission set, right, is, and it requires a lot of force protection, whereas like in the maneuver uh, mission set, your protection is inherent by moving more quickly. You know, so there's, there's these sort of trade-off functions. I'm wondering how this system assesses value uh, so that you can make an objective decision. Yeah, great, great point. So, so we have let me uh, two things. One is uh, at, at some level, you know, we get to the, the missions, uh, mission analysis, and the, the metrics. We, we get to analyze at least the 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 the, the risk or uh, the cost risk to let's say red or us in terms of the the actual you know when we analyze the, the the engagement, for example, in terms of what are the options that are be more cost effective for us and increase in and create the more risk to the to red, right? The, the issue is that then at the same time, this is an engineering activity uh, that goes along with the efforts that, that take place at CAPE, uh, a cost and analysis uh, 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 activity in the Pentagon, uh, that, that they went to get into that uh, cost assessment, right, or risk assessment in terms of the trade off that they need to make at their, at their portfolio level, right, or, the, or the, at the budgeting level. But we, it's informed by this technical analysis. And then also, this is, uh, gets codified in the technology investment roadmaps that the principal directors and, and the decision makers within OSD implement. So, uh, so it's, it, think of it, of the, this is the engineering piece of it that fits into that next step, which is the, the trade off that needs to happen, whether I invest more on, on a high, hypersonics versus direct energy to address the same mission gap. But I know I need a complement of both, but uh, it's it, you know it's a numbers uh, 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 issue at the same uh, as well, right? That, that there's not enough to go around. But uh, but we, we we have discussed this. In fact, I'm gonna follow up on, on Friday with Kate and kind of look at how they're looking at mission engineering threats and within the, the department at large, uh, in, and then of course with ANS uh, with our capability portfolio management activities where they look at risk, you know, on the programs. So um, so it's all in there. Uh, but we just want to make sure we focus on uh, and the uh, initially and in the engineering type analysis that needs to take place prior to get to that uh, decision making, which will happen based on the analytical uh, output that comes out of this uh, effort. The only follow-up to that I would ask is: Are operation and sustainment concerns included in that uh, particular analysis of alternatives? The, the, the logistic considerations, they will uh, have to be uh, even actually as part of our a part of an analysis uh, when we do our mission engineering piece. I mean, we, they, you know, the, the discussions are, we really need to truly understand how we're gonna deliver these capabilities and uh, how we're gonna sustain them in the field, what sort of the logistic consideration is to take place. However, uh, again, that's uh, the, the, the next follow on in terms of uh, the full uh, 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 grown program considerations from uh, programmatic deployment, uh, sustainment, and so on. That would be activities that were done by ANS and others. Uh, we just put, put together that initial upfront consideration that needs to be, keep in mind when they go and decide what sort of investments we wanna make. Great, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rob, for your question. Uh, and James, you had a couple questions. James Martin, um, you're able to unmute. I think you already are if you would like to ask your questions directly. Yeah, going back a slide or two, you showed a process flow, and it talks about mission threads and mission engineering threads. And I was uh, wondering what's the difference. Yeah, sure. And the guide actually explained this section well. Um, so think in terms of the okay, so we got a mission, you got a set of objectives. The mission threads basically define uh, those objectives in terms of what the commander wants. Intent is the mission engineering thread is once you add the, the variables of uh, hey, here's a, the different system or capabilities I want to integrate to be able to achieve that mission. 
that's that's what we would term as a mission agent, right? So, uh, so uh, let's say the mission threat is you know, how to go after a SAG, a surface action group, and what sort of options. I should start putting variables to it and say, well, I can do it with hypersonic, or I can do it with direct energy, or I can do it with cyber, or whatever. And you start doing an engineering analysis, that becomes a mission engineering threat. Okay. Yeah, my second question is um, it looks like, like what you call mission engineering is another name for what they call in the Air Force the analysis of alternatives. Or is there a, a key difference between ME and AOA? Yeah, I mean, you can think of it as an analysis of alternatives. Uh, I mean, it's, that's what codified into uh, the DOD 5000 uh, instruction and, and that sort of thing. But, but really, this is truly sometimes this analysis of alternatives stop short of doing that whole assessment of the mission and the intent of the mission and then, and then really looking at uh, no kidding, do we truly understand what the problem space is and the, the development of those metrics and then warfighter agreeing on, okay, yeah, that's what it is. So you can, you can I would say that this is more of a, a way for us to, uh, to truly uh, impose some more engineering rigor in that analysis. Because when you do analysis of alternatives, for the most part, they tend to be more qualitative in nature. You know, such a matter of expert thinking, well, perhaps I have this or I run a model here and there, but they always tend to be uh, non-integrated. That's same, the same thing that happened with those capability-based assessments that, that we do in the joint staff and others that are qualitative in nature. There's a bit of engineering analysis, but there's not a really engineering entity that is kind of pulling it all together and that you can follow this repeatable process uh, that everybody can, can, you know, abide to and say, hey, here's my best analysis of alternatives, if you want to put it in those terms based on the, a, a, real, a real common approach. And that's what we're trying to get to. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks so much for your question. Yeah, very good question, appreciate it. I think somebody posted the, no, that's the uh, AOA handbook, okay, got it. Yeah, so it's sort of in reference to that question. Um, yep, and, and Maya did put it in the chat, the, uh, the handbook, the, the link to the handbook, and we'll make sure that in our follow-up uh, that we include a direct link there as well. Uh, so folks can read up uh, on their own time a little bit more. Um, it kind of ties in with Larry Rising's, uh, Rising's question. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, but Larry, you're able to unmute if you'd like to pose your question directly. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, you got my name right, uh, Rising. Um, it, it's more of a question. Of, it's a wonderful presentation, by the way, and I, I appreciate it. I'm looking at this mission engineering guide and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, is this intended to be a requirements document uh, for which you expect all of DOD to, to say we comply? Or is this like a compendium of knowledge and practices to take into consideration as you're, as you're doing this work? And I'm, I'm picking up multiple must statements. There's should statements, which some folks interpret as requirements. So I'm just wondering what your perspective is on, on how, how to digest and, and consume and use the mission engineering guide. Right, it's kind of both, I will say. I mean, and again, as USDR and &E, research and engineering uh, establish a, a more uh, cohesive effort to, to truly you know, identify a, a way of uh, capturing what's really needed and where we need to make investments. You will think that, you know, with respect to people coming to us with ideas or, or uh, hey, you know, we have a capability that will address the mission X or Y, they use the guide to kind of present those ideas so we can communicate using the same language and the same approach. Uh, however, it's, it's not prescriptive and, and it's not, uh, I mean, what we want to get is to get people to think in terms of, hey, if I'm given a problem set, let me just kind of follow a common methodology so I know who to call and ask questions and so on, but, but it's not really... I cannot say that it's really a uh, uh, a requirement uh, uh, in a sense to, you know, you must abide to this process A, B, and C, but more of a, you need to follow the framework. Now, if you look at an instruction, the other instruction 5,000.88 on engineering, you there clearly say, you know, you need to implement mission engineering in your early on process before you go and start doing your system engineering activity. So, so one way or the other, you got an instruction that tells you, yep, it's, just, it's a requirement, you got to do mission integration, mission engineering. And then the other one in here, here's a mission engineering guide that has the best common, what we think are to the point, our best approach to how to handle the, you know, be able to do the studies and analysis and then come back and communicate with us, right? So, so I think it'll be a both. Excellent. Thank you. That answered my question. Okay. Over. 
Thanks so much, Larry. And then Rob, you, uh, Rob Lewis, you had a, a follow-up comment that uh, I think would be great for the group as well. Uh, sure. Yeah. The 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 it was in regard to the analysis of alternatives, and uh, given the document that I'm familiar with and the discussion and the presentation up to here for, the more closer. Uh, military process that this would be associated with would be the analysis, the center of gravity analysis um, that's taught in the CGSC. So that's the ends, ways, and means assessment that defines a feasible solution space. Then your follow on activity from that is to conduct an analysis of alternatives in that feasible region uh, that you sort of compare and contrast against each other. And that's part of the military, and then you flow through the military decision making process. You know, but where I think mission engineering really is, is in defining the problem, you know, and defining your, your suitability thresholds and your acceptability standards, so. Right, and then identifying those gaps, right, on terms of capability. We think that we have it solved already, but for example, are we thinking through the, all the options and the potential different ways on how to accomplish those missions? That's, uh, that's in a sense we're also trying to accomplish. And then can, you, can we prove it? Do we have the engineering? Uh, uh, rigor into the analysis so that that we can really prove that that uh, it can be done uh, in a different way or a different fashion. Uh, yeah, that that I mean, in terms of discussion, um, that that is the part of the process in architecture that seems to be most lacking, is that there's a heavy reliance on uh, heuristics uh, right. and sort of heroic designers um, sort of being able to put all of the pieces and parts together which is hard to find, hard to develop, and hard to keep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. No, and that's, that's the thing. You, you, at the end of the, of the day, we got to prove that, uh, yeah, well, the thought process uh, sticks and, uh, and that it's, uh, it's robust enough to uh, be able to defend it. Right now, like you said, it's all based on heuristics or budget matter expert ideas and, and whatever. And, uh, and we think the analysis is done, but when you start peeling the onion, at the end, that has to happen. And we really put it in to make sure that so we get some. I mean, if you look at the Pentagon, the Pentagon is a large facility, but at the end, it's uh, how much engineering analysis is really happening in that place is questionable. So that's what we want to get back to. Hey, let's re re recover and, and uh, that, that capability that I'm sure it was there when during World War II and others, and, and ensure that uh, we have a really strong team that can answer this critical question, especially in a technical, from a technical perspective. Uh, and, and you don't have to outsource every time somebody comes with a question for us. Great point. Thank you again for the, the input. Um, uh, we also included Bill Howell. Um, you had a couple questions in here and you're able to ask your questions directly if you'd like. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hello? Yes, uh, we can hear you, Bill. My questions are pretty narrow and specific. Uh, my interest for a long time has been neural networks and what I call the, uh, what is often in the past called computational intelligence. Uh, somehow that got co-opted and generalized with artificial intelligence. But uh, the first question relates to uh, within the area of mission engineering itself, is there actually an application uh, of uh, advanced uh, systems uh, such as neural networks, evolutionary computation, or other tools to assist you in that optimizing resource allocation area? Um, or is that still way too far down the road uh, to be used? Because deep learning neural networks um, have been considered to be quite successful and very narrow, highly complex diagnostic uh, applications such as uh, legal lawyers, uh, very, very experienced lawyers, or medical diagnose, diagnosis often beating human beings. But in your area, does this have any reality now? Is there sort of a, any evolution into human uh, uh, advanced systems for mission engineering because it, it's a very difficult well, I mean, it's an exciting question because I see it. I see it because, you know, for the most part, the, the technology is here now. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's getting better by the day. 
Uh, but uh, deep learning, machine learning, AI, computational intelligence, all these tools that, that are being actually currently integrated by the private sector, you know, we, we in the Department of Defense, we need to make, make better use of it. Um, you know, for the most part, usually the human gets in the way of the AI. I mean, when AI kind of come up with concepts and idea how to perhaps achieve a mission in a war game, the human kind of gets in and say, well, how do you thought about that? And, and they're trying to disrupt the thought process. So how do I develop an architecture and that's what I'm heading to is in terms of uh, how do we can start with machine learning and go from there, uh, get to uh, neural, neural, uh, neural networks. And, 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 and uh, for example, we give a scenario and, and let the machine tell, hey, this is how we'll actually do the mission and accomplish these are the options that we use. And then compare to that with that the human think. And then at the end, come up with a most optimal solution that is within the, the confines of the rules of engagement and the ethical issues that we need to consider. Because obviously we also have to keep in mind that you know, the AI uh, systems, you know, sometimes they're, 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 they're uh, I guess, not limited with regard to what reality is. And, and uh, we just need to make sure that uh, we, don't, we don't break any, any laws or anything in, the, in that process. So, but I truly believe uh, that AI and, and all these technologies are here now. Uh, I like to be able to leverage more and more. Uh, it's part of the uh, that mission engineering digital ecosystem we want to implement. Uh, on those ideas, uh, how far I get it or how fast I get it, I don't know. Because again, I need to get the best practitioners and uh, together and think through how do we can make this happen uh, without reinventing the wheel, which is another thing that I want to make sure that I avoid. But the one thing is I, I really, and I think that you, you Bill, you, or Bill Curtis had a question here about out of the box thinking and ensuring that when we think about missions and the potential technologies, you know, how do I know that I'm accessing the, the truly the true uh, visionaries out there that can tell me whether this mission analysis has been done perhaps from a different perspective? I mean, because I mean, for the most part, I'm a, I've been in a, I'm in the military as well as a, as a Marine and, and a Naval officer. And for the most time, we get boxed in based on what our bosses tell us. Yeah, this is the way I'm going to fight it. And that's the way we're going to fight it. Right. Uh, but, you know, how do I do an, that on front? I'll hinder approach where you know, I get these, these guys with these great ideas and, and how do I discover them? And that's got to be my, that's also part of my challenge. You know, how do I discover these great minds out there that perhaps can help us address a problem where I might make the need for, 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 for conflict necessary because there's other ways to, to address this. So um, that's kind of what I get to, over. Thanks for that. Very much, uh, uh, Sorry, go ahead. Just, should I ask the second question? Uh, the second question is really kind of strange. It's, it's very haunting to me. And uh, your area really, and that is uh, normally um, in a lot of the computational areas, there <coughs> is a curse of dimensionality where high dimensionality is a, a, a barrier or an impediment to actually getting to the answers that you want. Um, they can in terms of computability problems and all that sort of stuff. Um, but over the years, there have been some very interesting comments on the inapplicability of normal statistics to high dimensionality. Real big trouble or completely mislead yourself by using concepts such as uh, means and standard deviations for high dimensional systems. Um, Alexander Gorban, a, a Russian mathematician, I think, uh, who is now a professor in the US, I believe, um, has given some recent presentations on the blessing of dimensionality. And some of that was um, explicit with respect to how do you actually explainable AI? I don't like the term artificial intelligence. I like the term because they're very different to me anyways. So how do, if, if you're going to be using a very uh, complex system, a black box that is usually very difficult to sort of analyze in terms of what is this actually doing? Uh, what about the stability control ability flying aircraft or ground vehicles and stuff like that. If you can't prove that mathematically, how do you deal with that? What about application in area of areas of medical systems where you, you really don't want to be using an unknown 
transcontinental kill kill the patient you're trying to save. So this explainable AI has been very interesting the way that it's been uh, presented um, within the context of high dimensional systems, which mission engineering in the Department of Defense certainly has to grow, grapple with that. Have you anything or heard anything about people trying to use tools from inspired by um, the blessing of dimensionality in your area? So thank you. It actually, that's, that's very good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm aware of uh, some of the efforts on explainable AI. I have not read Corbin's uh, effort on blessing of dimensionality. All I know that uh, I, I cannot tell you how many dimensions I'm actually working on in the particle movement for you know, uh, like if, let's say an aircraft, you know, and employing those six stuff, and then, uh, and I, but then on top of that, there's the EW concern, there's the cyber, there is all these other combined effects, and and then at this interaction between the mission itself and the politics and everything else. I mean, this is a extremely multidimensional problem that we're dealing with, and then on top of that is the jointness aspect, is the actual working with our partners and allies, and how they, what do they bring to the table, and so on and so on. So uh, I definitely uh, uh, would like to talk to you a little bit more about it. If you can share some of your thoughts on blessing dimensionality, or uh, I'll try to look at the, uh, the the paper itself, or if somebody can uh, make it accessible, I, I'll love to, uh, to be able to read it and and think it through. Because I mean, I'm, I, I, I've thought about this in multiple ways. Obviously, um, I, I I think in terms of system dynamics, you know, and, and trying to understand the the casual effects of everything and the feedback loops and all that. Uh, but but not in a sense of how they, how do you do their math behind it, right? I mean, we can use feedback loops and you know all the uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, differential equations and so on. But but I don't think that captured what you're talking about. Uh, so uh, I think it would be very helpful to have a further discussion on this. It might shed the light on all the things that we need to be considering in the Department of Defense that we're not. Yeah, and uh, I could pat. I'm I'm no expert in this. I'm just by it and previous to Alexander Gorban also uh, uh, Daniel Prokhorov uh, we used to call him the worldwide manager of computational intelligence for Toyota out of the technical center in I think Dearborn Michigan uh, he uh, actually hosted Gorban's presentation as a plenary talk for the uh, last summer's 2020 World uh, um, Congress on Computational Intelligence, and and Daniel has been working on these challenges, uh, which he's very conservative and, and not willing to jump off a cliff on uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, he has done a lot of thinking on that, for example, and obviously for Toyota, he had a great saying: "We're not Tesla; we're Toyota." Uh, we're not going to, uh, forget his words, really risk the whole organization on, on something that, you know, has some real uh, driverless cars. And, and um, obviously his thinking has been drifting to that area too. So Gorban and, and Daniel Prokhorov would be the, the best people to actually speak to initially, but I could send some contact information. Yeah, that'd be great. I really appreciate that. Sure. Thanks so much for that, Bell. Um, yeah, if, if you have any links to, to the direct uh, material, that'd be excellent. Um, and kind of widening the question or, or pulling back a little bit um, to a more broad question, uh, Dinesh Verma had the question, from your perspective, uh, perspective what are your most um, significant imp uh, impedance factors or I guess greatest obstacles, the technical, the organizational or cultural? Good question. Um, I would say let's start with three, three of them, right? I mean, uh, one is the culturally, again, the Department of Defense uh, is the greatest democracy is out there. I mean, you would think that uh, it's more of a dictatorial because we have a, a leadership and they said, go make this happen. But at the end, it's really up to individual service and whoever wants to do whatever they want and how they want to invest their money. Sometimes abide by Congress and the staffers say, yeah, go do this. And you come back and, and, and senior leadership try to change it. And it get in trouble, but so so that's one. So changing the culture in the sense that everybody can say adopt, you know, become a framework to really do all this early on thinking that needs to happen before we start investing and we start 
asking the, our system engineers and product and architects and, and all that uh, and our scientists to, uh, to really spend time working on, 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 on things. Uh, I will say that that culture is important, you know, just say, change the mindset. And I think now it's, it's getting there. Now we're going to have change administration. So, so we'll see what happens. But uh, I think this is actually a good way to kind of bring everybody together and, and kind of speak the same language, have these kind of conversations. Uh, technically, again, uh, we really need this capability in the Pentagon. We really need to have a place where I can have the, the joint staff folks and I can have everybody else come in and have a session, a place where we can have these high level discussions. And I see it uh, in the visual tools that, that are there that can show the fish that went behind. How do we get to this decision? We got to move beyond PowerPoint. And the Department of Defense still works and operates in PowerPoint. Uh, now, we cannot just think that it's going to be uh, a black box doing the analysis for us. We, there's got to be humans thinking through all these problems. And then on, in terms of uh, people, I, I, I need to the, the, you know, be able to have an organization that I can tap into that have the intellectual rigor. We actually hire in uh, uh, at least a contractor staff that has a tremendous amount of uh, technical capabilities. But on the government side, I'm very limited. So I'm, I don't have to figure out a way you know, in the space and find the space in the Pentagon so that I can bring people in that have uh, the, the know-how on how to do this and, uh, and then bring them on rotational assignments and giving them an opportunity to go and contribute. Because I mean, at the end, uh, I know it's not everything's gonna be done in the, in the OST in the Pentagon, but we really need to get our act together and provide a better guidance to the services and the community and the industry. And, uh, and that takes people. I mean, this is a contact sport on one man deep and all the people helping us out through the process. Uh, but I really need the, 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 you know, those young engineers and scientists and researchers and, and, uh, and the folks that are the support staff to help us, you know, really get to where we need to, which is a coherent uh, approach to how we're going to address the challenge we're going to have uh, down the road. Uh, I know that our peer competitors are doing it. I know that they, they really have making the best effort they can to bring together the best of the people, the brightest, uh, give them the tools, give them the space and get them the bureaucracy out of the way so that I can get this done. So I guess we got to do the same. Definitely. That's a great point. And hopefully something that uh, between CERC, uh, Judith Zaman's work uh, in this area as well can can help aid in, in moving us forward. Uh, and Barry, you could probably speak to that as well. Um, and and I know we're, we're uh, over the time limit that we had allotted from 1.30 to 2.30. So Elmer, let us know if, if, uh, if you, you're tight on time. Um, you can otherwise, go to the last four questions if you want. Um, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. There's a couple that are in the chat, so I, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to everything, but you just let us know as your as your time um, constricts you. Um, well, it would be good to get Bill Curtis and Joe Matola to uh, have their questions. At least uh, that uh, that'll extend extend it some, but maybe we can stop after that. Sounds great. And, and Barry, right. Ready? Bill, yeah. Bill yeah. Curtis, I think, uh, Elmer, you, you had answered um, that question directly already, but Bill, if you had any elaboration on that, that'd be great before we turn over to, to Joe. Well, yeah, and the sort of the step beyond that is, you know, when the, the commander's in the field fighting uh, and they've got your mission plan and how all their resources are integrated, They've they've got to be agile because you know the the famous statement every battle plan lasts until the first engagement with the enemy. Is there a way that you within the context of how you do this this mission integration and planning can think about how you can make them enable them to be more agile when they're out in the field, you know, fighting an engagement? Right, and that's that should be the intent, right? Of uh, any any mission uh, uh, effort that we do, uh, it, it gives them the capability for that agility and uh, flexibility in the battlefield. Uh, and then at the same time, so that they can be able to make the, the proper decisions at their level uh, without having to go back too much for, you know, uh, high level decision making. So that has to be a consideration that should be part of the measure of efficiency or efficacy that, that get designed into the problem as we do our mission analysis. So, I mean, in the end, uh, being able to identify a uh, commander, being able to maneuver it, or if not, then uh, leverage whatever resources you have at, at hand, whether it's actually to do a, a partner, partnership with the, some ally and without having to do, figure out the contracting mechanism, you know, he has a target opportunity for making something happen. 
uh, that's that might be something that, that would have to be considered as part of the analysis or whether he just uh, uh, reconfigured the network that he's operating on uh, right on the field and instead of having to wait for some uh, bureaucrat somewhere to say, hey, yeah, you cannot do that or yay, you know, giving the options for them to do it. So uh, agility, uh, uh, dispersion, uh, speed, all of that has to be in consideration, taken in consideration as part of those metrics uh, as we design these missions. Okay. You know, I, I, in reading General Mattis's book recently, Call Sign Chaos, the one thing I noticed about how he generated agility was probably starts with some of the things you're doing. He, uh, they look at all kinds of bizarre scenarios, but then beyond that, they practice, practice, practice responses to each one of them which means that when they get in the battle, it's not an invention, it's practicing something they've already tried against one of the scenarios that they, they, uh, they dreamed up. Yeah. Uh, so and that's what I'm also, I mean, I'm a reservist. So I always think that, that we have a reserve force, which we can turn into an experimentation force that can go out there and do the training with these new technologies. Then on a rotational basis, they go and deploy and train the active duty guys so that they can then you know, be able to adopt the technology without having to Break, you know, and take the, uh, active duty forces and do the training and with things that are not there in, in, in the field yet, and they might not see five, ten years later or five years later, I will say, and, and uh, we should be able to create something that allows them to come in, train, and then incorporate institutionalize the capability and then move out, go back to training, and then and, and keep the cycle going and then keep these ideas uh, flowing. So uh, we got a lot to do in the department on that end, but uh, you agree, it's, it's, you, you got to train, train, train. Uh, not, and by the way, you got to train not today, not how you're going to fight today. If you're looking at a scenario of 2030, then how are we going to fight in 2030? You got to put yourself in that mindset too, which is yep. a challenge. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Bill. And that leads, I think, right into uh, Joe Matola's question. And Joe, I think you're, you're unmuted already. I hope so. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thank you, sir. So my question has to do with uh, the way that our systems are becoming increasingly software defined and agile and, and, and network embedded. But you didn't say much about DevSecOps or agile program management or systems engineering. We seem to be going from the deep V to uh, some other um, uh, acquisition and programmatics and uh, also field support with DevSecOps, but DevSecOps uh, and, and software can start way, way early on and then can include, you know, model-based and all that. So could you say a little more about Agile and DevSecOps uh, in, in your view of how it relates to mission in, uh, integration, sir? Yeah. Thank you. One of the early considerations in the mission analysis and uh, that early, early uh, uh, problem definition and development. Uh, we, for example, the JASC2 effort that looks at trust, uh, zero trust architectures. I mean, it's all better about the idea of uh, uh, DevSecOps uh, development. We, in fact, we're, we're engaged in some of that activity with the NC3 community, uh, the nuclear command and control communications community. So, and, and then of course, you know, using an agile environment for development of these tools and uh, whatever the software development, it's a, it's a critical part of the, of the effort. So we're, we're working with our prototyping and software folks uh, to define for the defines, uh, a lot of these constructs, uh, but absolutely, it's it's just part of the equation. I mean, it's uh, cyber and and, uh, and and protecting our, our data and our and networks. It, it has to, is that critical component of the early upfront uh, thought process that needs to happen as we design uh, new capabilities. So uh, it's in there. I think it's actually mentioned in the guide. Uh, so uh, or if not, it's not mentioned. It's mentioned in the DoD instruction five thousand point eight eight. But this is the kind of inputs we want to make sure that if it's not in the guide, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'll make sure that that gets incorporated uh, for the next version. Yeah, and your methodology slide didn't seem to have it in there. So I, I thought I'd ask. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's, 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 I will say, uh, think of it as part of that uh, uh, second phase of the, of the process. It's not looking at the of performance and whatever. Now, we're not really prescribing how do you go about doing it, other than there's MOSA. And there's DevSecOps, and then there's uh, agile, agile development. That that's all part of those tools that you use to uh, uh, develop your capability. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Joe, for tying that all together. <laughs> kind of ties all of our circ talks pretty well in line. 
Yeah. Uh, and I want to say that uh, the run, uh, Mitchell has a question, or Mitchell uh, has a question he's saying his mic is out. So he's posing the question in writing. Um, there's a notable decrease in the amount of entirely in-house capability development and a very apparent increase in the leveraging of off-the-shelf technologies across the DOD. Uh, the strategic approach may likely increase if budgets are constrained. What do you see as the phenomenon's impact to mission engineering in the future? And what would be the areas of mission engineering focus that would need to be bolstered uh, to ensure that any lack of insight associated with CODIS products and uh, proprietary nature of them? Right. So, so we, I mean, again, we're, we're trying to identify what are those the sort of the right investments that we need to make. So, right, I'm, I'm not really into... Uh, one way or the other, everything has to be done in-house or whether it has to be uh, MOSA, use model open system approaches that most, most part leverage cuts and whatever. Uh, but it's really more on the lines of, uh, you know, am I, am I doing enough to sort of truly understand the environment I'm going to be operating, to truly understand my, what are my gaps and, and, and I'm be able to identify what are those right investments that need to be made. I mean, am I building the right things, right? Uh, versus... Just, just getting to, okay, building a bunch of stuff, building it right, but at the end, when you come back, like I was mentioned earlier, and there's no room or home for them. Um, so so that's definitely, you know, the, the main objective of mission engineering, it's, it's really look at that uh, and identify those capabilities. But then, um, obviously, there's there are opportunities uh, that were, you know, investments and development have been made within the, within the government. Uh, rightly so, we want to be able to leverage those uh, but there's invest if there are cuts opportunities somewhere or products that are out there that will allow us to do the mission better and, and, and accomplish the objectives, then we need to make sure that one, if we're not buying into a closed system, that that's the key here, because this system has to be able to inoperate with inoperable with the other systems. So uh, it's really the, the way we really want to make sure that uh, we, we are addressing this problem. Yep, and Ron seems to have a follow up. It, uh, it seems we would need to increase the accrual of technical debt. Uh, it needs to be incorporated in the mission engineering processes. Can you define technical debt? Uh, yeah, technical debt is uh, a, a term that uh, uh, helps you evaluate uh, uh, how you have uh, uh, done uh, uh, as, as you're uh, evolving your system, uh, you make various kinds of, uh, of decisions that uh, uh, cause you a lot of trouble in, in the future. And uh, basically, uh, uh, these things, the, the, uh, the later you fix them, the more it's going to cost. And so you're paying interest on this technical debt. Yeah, so I definitely, if you have a paper on that, I like to read it. I like the term. Uh, yes, well, that's the whole intent of this, right? So to ensure that, uh, you know, the, the earlier you address the, 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 the challenges that associated with the mission and the gaps that you identify in terms of capabilities or technology, of the technology opportunity, and then the, and then the timelines, right? Because, I mean, at some point, the more I wait, for example, if I know there's a threat in a 2030 time frame that is going to make uh, uh, either it's going to challenge some of my capabilities in a space and whatever, and, the, and the, the more I wait to be able to counter that or develop a feel of capability, uh, I need to be able, you know, be able to assess that for my analysis in, in itself. So uh, otherwise, uh, if we just continue and not putting things into a, a, a time perspective, uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, but we don't know whether those ongoing programmer records are leading to obsolescence two or three years from now or 10 years from now, knowingly that we, we do have uh, a challenge moving right in front of our eyes and we're not doing anything about it. So uh, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but uh, uh, I, I like the idea of the technical tech concept. I have not heard it before, but I, I appreciate it. Okay, I, I will follow up with you. And uh, yeah, the, the CERC has developed a number of, of tools to uh, help a project uh, 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 follow uh, and, and, and extrapolate the, it, the technical debt. And uh, uh, so I, I, I can uh, uh, provide you with some tools that show, yeah, for 
in some cases, commercial projects who follow the for 10 years and then see uh, 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 how how they could have done it better if, if they had not, uh, if, if they'd had access to what was happening to their technical debt. Yeah, absolutely. And that's intent, really, right? It's just better inform uh, those developers so that they know where to invest their energy and, and resources. So the earlier we do that, the less time, the less, the less time we waste in the process. Definitely. It looks like Ron agrees, saying it aligns well with the intent uh, and uh, kind of brings in the whole ontology and semantics. <laughs> yeah, sure. but, um, sure, so yeah. That's why we're we doing this, right? Uh, you know, you're getting everybody to speak the same language and, and that sort of thing. We have, I'm referring to it differently, but hey, if there's a unifying concept that the community up there has that we can adopt and, and get everybody to kind of uh, converge in this thought process, that'd be great. Yeah, I think part of um, the intent for Circ Talks is just that of having all of the different entities come from different perspectives and uh, just almost translate the conversation so that everybody's on the same page uh, in that aspect. So really appreciate your time. Uh, I know we're already 20 minutes over <laughs> our scheduled um, time. If there are any other uh, questions or comments that anyone would like to add in, um, feel free to send them to starktalks.stevens.edu for further follow-up. Uh, we'll definitely pass it along um, to Elmer's team and to Elmer himself. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, from, for joining in. And thank you, Alma, for your time uh, and being so generous with it today. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, Barry, Elmer, did you have anything else to add before we, we close out? And I, I have to say thank you. Uh, no, I, I think that covers it. That... Excellent. Yeah, and, um, and yeah. in the follow-up, we'll, we'll post, Barry, what you had mentioned of some of the, the CERC resources. Elmer, what you had mentioned of uh, some of the literature and publications from the DOD to try and get that that complete picture in this follow up uh, for everyone to to kind of continue this conversation. Oh, and also we do have some of those presentations. I think Barry that you'd mentioned about the CERC work in uh, from our CERC research review uh, 2020. And uh, as you see from the slide, all the presentations and slide decks and posters from that event are up and available on the CERC website. Um, and I think Elmer, in the next uh, two slides, just kind of Let's uh, everyone know what our future uh, tentative dates are for the CERC Talks 2021, um, where I think we'll be doing more of a deep dive into the digital engineering um, aspect for the next series. Um, but then in the follow-up, uh, you can see all of our different social channels for to uh, have a copy of this presentation, as well as the recording uh, will be available uh, next week on the site. Um, but again, thank you so much, Elmer. Thank you, Barry. Thank you everyone for your questions. And for uh, continuing this conversation, I'm sure this is just one one of the, the pieces in what is a much longer conversation, as you, we, you can already tell. Great. Thank you. I truly enjoyed the talk. I appreciate the opportunity. OK, well, we appreciate you or your uh, contributions, because uh, these are the kind of things that we're trying to get the uh, talks uh, 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 series uh, uh, to uh, address questions like the ones that you're uh, coping with. So thanks again. All right, sounds good. And, and again, if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll make sure my team, uh, Mark Goldenberg and, and uh, John Andrews and other in the team uh, can go out and, and, uh, and answer it for you. So, uh, and then we have, uh, again, the much larger community with uh, uh, Stephanie Pussell and, and Philomena Silverman, digital engineering. So we got a good community that uh, we can go and reach out and help out as much as we can.